now it is time for me to go over relations between properties. Now what I am going to do is I have a set of slides which I am going to use. We have said earlier that second law of thermodynamics provides us three things. First, possibility, impossibility that we have seen. In limits on processes, we have seen efficiency is less than or equal to something, delta S less than or equal to something. If you say less than delta S is greater than or equal to dq by t, that means that for a given delta S, there is going to be a limit on the amount of Q that you can have. In fact, when we combine first and second law, we will be able to quantify this limit in some way, the so called exergy analysis. The third thing the second law allows us to do is to derive property relations. And the first property relation for a simple compressible system or a fluid system at rest is we have already seen T s equals d u plus P d u. And that is what we are going to do. In property relations, we are going to consider relations between properties of a simple compressible or fluid system at rest. And we will be assuming a unit mass of the system. So, we work with specific properties and the mass of the system does not have to be explicitly included in the proceedings. The tools which we are going to use are calculus of exact differentials. We have used exact differential, but only one property of that exact differential. Now, here we will be using some more properties. We will be using calculus of partial derivatives along with calculus of exact differentials. Before we go to the property relations proper, we define some energy functions. Energy functions are properties, derived properties using the internal energy of a system. The internal energy of the system is the primary function, the energy itself and it is U, the thermal internal energy. The second law defines S, which is the second more, second important or perhaps a more important energy function. Then we have already seen the basic property relation between the two, T d s is d u plus P d v. Now, apart from basic property relation, we will be also using the first law, which is d q equals d u plus d w. It is important for us to see that this is a property relation, here P d v is only P d v, nothing more. Everything here is property or a change in property, no interaction is involved in the basic property relation. Although you can say P d v represents the expansion work done, we will let it represent, but this here the significance of every term is simply a property or a change in some property. But we will also be using the first law in which d q and d w are interactions and here d w is the differential of the work including all its components. So, do not jump to the conclusion that d w is p d v, it could be p d v plus some other components of work. And we will also be using the second law which is with transposition of t turns out to be t d s is greater than d q greater than or equal to dq or T d s is greater than d u plus d w. Here I have replaced d q by the right hand side of the first law expression. Now, let us do some exercises. We first have the internal energy u and let us expand this the expression for first law d q is d u plus d w which is du plus p d v plus d w other than p d v. Okay. So, this just tells us that d q at constant volume is du 
plus d w other, where d w other means d w other than p d u. We are also familiar with the second energy function enthalpy, it is a derived function. and we have defined enthalpy equal to u plus p v. Differentiating this, we get d h equals d u plus p d v plus v d p. If you use the first law, d q is d u plus p d v plus d w other substitute for du plus p d v from this expression and you will get d q is d h minus v d p plus d w other, from which we see that d q the heat absorbed at constant pressure is d h plus d w other. So, these two expressions one should be familiar with, because common mistake is assume that for a constant uh, volume process d q equals d u, that is not true, it will be true only if d w other is 0. Same thing for a constant pressure process d q p will be d h only if d w other is 0. Now, we are going to define two special energy functions, the first of them is the Helmholtz function given the symbol A. Uh, chemists quite often call this the Helmholtz free energy or simply free energy and use the symbol F. So, you should be familiar with both the symbols A as well as F. A the Helmholtz function is defined as U minus T s. Notice that T s has the dimensions of energy. So, we can combine U and T s. It is defined as U minus T s. If you take a differential you will get d a equals d u minus t d s minus s d t. And if you apply first law, d u is d q minus d w. And if you now apply the second law, you will get d a plus d w plus s d t equal to d q minus t d s, which according to second law is less than or equal to 0. keeping d w on the left hand side, it tells us that d w will be less than or equal to minus d a minus s d t. And now, if you consider an isothermal process, it tells us that work done by a system in an isothermal process will always be less than or equal to the work, the decrease in its Helmholtz function. Now, remember that the work done equals our traditional mechanical way of looking at things is work done is decrease in some potential. The potential energy goes down, the amount by which it goes down is the amount of work you can do, if everything is ideal. If there is friction or some other dissipative process the amount of work which you can extract will be less than the decrease in the potential energy. So, using that idea, we can consider the Helmholtz function A to be some sort of a potential and hence sometimes it is called the Helmholtz potential, a decrease in which represents the maximum work that can be obtained in an isothermal process. The next important energy function, the final one which we derive or define is G known as the Gibbs function. The Gibbs function is defined as U plus P V minus T S. You can rewrite it if you want as H minus T S or you can rewrite it if you want as A plus P V, because they are all related to each other. Differentiating it, you will get an expansion in terms of du, dv, dp, ds and dt. Now, apply first law, 
du plus p d v plus d w other will be d q. So, d u plus p d v will be d q minus d w other and then keep d q and t d s on one side and you will get d g plus d w other minus v d p plus s d t which is equal to d q minus t d s less than or equal to 0. This less than or equal to 0 is a consequence of the second law. Keeping d w other on one side, now you will get d w other, other means other than expansion work, less than or equal to minus d g plus v d p minus s t t. And hence, if I consider a process which is constant pressure, constant temperature. Now, remember that if you have a chemical reaction taking place, electrochemical or even an ordinary reaction, it is possible for us to change the state while keeping the pressure and temperature constant because the composition will change. And if the state changes, you can always do some work. And hence, we can show that d w, the work done other than expansion work in a constant pressure, constant temperature or isobaric cum isothermal process will be less than or equal to the decrease in the Gibbs function in that process, during that process. Compare this with the expression for the Helmholtz function and we can now say that the Gibbs function it is a function similar to the Helmholtz function in that it can be considered as a potential, the decrease in which represents the maximum work other than expansion. Notice this d w other here, other than expansion that can be produced, that can be obtained in an isobaric cum isothermal process. And since most of our chemical reactions are uh, Isotherm, isobaric cum isothermal processes, they take place at ambient pressure, ambient temperature or can be made to take place at ambient pressure, ambient temperature. The Gibbs function is, a, is an important idea and that is the basis function on which much of physical chemistry and chemical engineering is based. Chemical engineers are very, very comfortable with the Gibbs function just the way we mechanical thermal engineers are comfortable with enthalpy. Now, this was the introduction to the four uh, functions u, h, a and g. Now, we look at the properties of these four energy functions and we will use the specific property version. Everything will be considered per unit mass of the system. And we will use the property relation and we will be using the following identities from calculus of partial differentials. We will say that if z is a smooth function of x and y, smooth means the first and second derivatives are defined. And if the differential of dz m dx plus n dy is an exact differential, if z is a function then dz will be an exact differential. If it is expressible in form, if it is expressed in the form m into dx plus n into dy, then m must be partial of z with respect to x at constant y and n should be partial of z with respect to y at constant x. Not only that, equating the cross derivatives, the second partial derivative of z first with respect to x and then with respect to y will equal the second partial derivative of z first respect to y and then with respect to x. And hence the partial of m with respect to y at constant x will equal the partial of n with respect to x at constant y. These are the two relations which we are going to use innumerable times henceforth for our derivations. Now, the next four slides would apply these to the four functions u, h, a and g. 
first let us look at the internal energy U. We have the property relation, a transpose property relation. The basic property relation is T d s minus P d v. So, uh, sorry, basic property relation is T d s equals d u plus P d v. So, here we have d u equals T d s minus P d v. So, notice that because we have a d s and d v on the right hand side, it is natural for us to consider u to be a function of s and v. We can say that S R V are the naturally uh, formed or the most natural independent variables to consider u to be a function of. Now, when you do that from our laws of partial derivatives, we know that T must be partial of u with respect to S at constant v and P must be partial of u with respect to v at constant S. In fundamental thermodynamics, these two relations are known as the thermodynamic definition of temperature and thermodynamic definition of pressure or thermodynamic temperature and thermodynamic pressure. For the simple reason that consider this triad of properties U, S and V. We realize that the moment we define any thermodynamic system we are able to define its volume. First law and second law of thermodynamics are able to help us define two properties of state. First law the internal energy U and second law the entropy S. So, U, S and V are considered the basic thermodynamic triad of properties for any systems. And based on this, now we know that temperature has to be the variation of U with entropy at constant volume and pressure has to be the variation of U with volume at constant entropy. And using this relation, particularly the pressure relation, we can define the thermodynamic pressure for a system which is not a fluid at all. For example, we can define it for a system purely containing radiation. If we know what is the energy of that radiation field is, what its volume is and what its entropy is, then we can determine its pressure simply by obtaining this partial derivative of u with respect to v at constant s with a negative sign. And now look at the next thing. If we use the cross derivative relation, we get how temperature varies with specific volume at constant s and how pressure varies with specific entropy at constant volume. An esoteric relation which we could not have imagined being able to derive using the first principles without going th through this algebra of partial derivatives. And we will see most, more such interesting relations. These are very useful relations in thermodynamics. Note this relation which is in a box here. Now, let us come to enthalpy. It is defined as U plus P V. So, if you take its differential and expand it and use the property relation for uh, T d s, you will get d h equals T d s plus V d p. So, now we consider enthalpy to be a function of entropy and pressure because we have d s and d p here and we immediately get temperature to be partial derivative of enthalpy with entropy at constant pressure and volume to be partial derivative of enthalpy with pressure at constant entropy. Look at the funny relations that we have. And the cross derivative relation gives us partial of temperature with pressure at constant entropy and partial of volume with respect to entropy at constant pressure. Note this expression in the box. Now, let us come to Helmholtz function. It is defined as U minus T s. 
So, expand it, expand du as T d s minus P d v, combine terms and you will get d a equals minus S d t minus P d v. Consider a as a function of t and v because there is a d t here and a d v here and you will get entropy to be negative of partial of a with respect to t at constant v and partial of uh, uh, pressure is negative of partial of a with respect to volume at constant t. And look at what the cross derivative tells us. It tells us that variation of entropy with volume at constant t equals the variation of pressure with temperature at constant v. Now, this expression is very important because look at what it tells us. On the right hand side, we have just the data which we get from the equation of state p, v and t, relationship between p, v and t. But the left hand side tells us how does entropy vary with volume at constant t. So, this is a very important relation which leads the variation of entropy with respect to volume to purely p v t data. Finally, we come to the Gibbs function which is defined as h minus t s. Take the differential of d g, expand, use the expansion of d h and use the basic property relation and you will get d g equals minus s d t plus v d p. And that means, it is proper for us to consider d g as a function of temperature sorry g as a function of temperature and pressure, because these are the two differentials remaining on the right hand side. When you do that, we realize that entropy is the negative of uh, variation of g with temperature at constant p and volume equals the variation of g with respect to pressure at constant t. And the cross derivative gives us a relation partial of entropy with pressure at constant t is negative of the partial of volume with temperature at constant p. And again this is important because the variation of entropy with pressure at constant temperature is provided to us in terms of only p v t information which is available simply from the equation of state. Okay. Now, these four blocked relations from the four slides I have put together here and these are known as Maxwell's relations and even their reciprocal for example, take this relation partial of t with respect to p at constant s is partial of v with respect to s at constant p. And if you take its reciprocal, we will get partial of p with respect to t at constant s equal to partial of s with respect to v at constant p. So, these re four relations and their reciprocals are known as the Maxwell's relations and these are perhaps the most celebrated relations in thermodynamics. So, these are very useful property relations. The third and fourth ones relate entropy variation to purely p v t or equation of state data. They help us reduce the requirement of C p and C v data for mapping the state space, because entropy variation is available at least in part using only p v t data. And one of the important tasks in the study and application of thermodynamics and one of the hardest job for a student of thermodynamics, any student of thermodynamics including us is how to remember them without having any funny material inside your trouser pockets. And we now find out a trick to do that, a physical realization and then some mathematical uh, tools. We consider a reversible cycle. Remember the 
area under a PV diagram, area under a quasi static process and area under the same process on the TS diagram that we have realized, we have discussed. Represent a reversible cycle on a PV diagram and also on a TS diagram. You will see two pictures like this. On a PV diagram, there is a reversible cycle. The same reversible cycle sketched on a TS diagram looks slightly different, but it is another closed loop. Let the area of the cycle in the PV plane be A PV. Let the area of the cycle in the TS plane be A TS. are the two areas equal. If all of you were to have a clicker or the all of you were to have the Akash with a clicker application, at this stage I would have rested for a few minutes and asked you to answer this question, yes or no. It is difficult for me to obtain such a feedback, but um, I suggest all of you write down in your notebook yes or no because soon I am going to give you the answer to this question and proceed from there. I hope you have written that. Now, I will relieve that the answer is yes, the areas are equal. And why are they equal? Because we have a reversible cycle. So, area under a curve represents heat transfer on the TS diagram. Area under the corresponding curve on the PV diagram represents the area, represents the work done, PDV work done. And hence, for an reversible cycle, the work done would only be P V, the heat transfer will then be equal to the work done P V diagram and hence the two areas are equal. Mathematically, the area of the loop in the P V diagram is the loop integral of d P d V and area in the loop on the TS diagram is the area integral dt ds. And this should be true for any reversible cycle of a simple compressible system at rest. And now, uh, go to our coordinate geometry. This is where the coordinate geometry is needed. Remember that if we transform x y coordinate to some u v coordinates. Then the area element d x d y gets transformed to area element d u d v by a local scale which is known as the Jacobian. And if the areas are always equal, that means the Jacobian of the transformation is 1. I am not going to spend any detail on discussing the properties of Jacobian and how it is defined. I recommend that you look up your elementary calculus and coordinate geometry book. But the symbol for a Jacobian, in terms of the Jacobian symbol, this means that the Jacobian of T s with respect to P v is 1 and so is the Jacobian of P v with respect to T s. And now, we will use the properties of Jacobian uh, to derive many of our relations. These properties of Jacobian are important. A Jacobian is a combination of partial derivatives, which behaves like an ordinary derivative. That is the special thing about it. So, the first relation is Jacobian of u v with respect to x y when you multiply it by the Jacobian of x y with respect to u v, that should be 1. This comes from the area transformation. If you transform it one way and back transform it, you should get back the same area. The product rule of ordinary derivative is also applicable. You have derivative of a with respect to b multiplied by derivative of b with respect to c is derivative of a with respect to c. So, Jacobian of P q with respect to R s multiplied by Jacobian of R s with respect to T u should be Jacobian, just cancel this. 
partial of R s and partial of R s and you get Jacobian of P q with Jacobian of T u with respect to T u. But the real important relations for us are these, you know the partial derivative of u with respect to x at constant y can always be written down in this form. It is shown, it can be shown to be equal to partial of u or Jacobian of u and y with respect to x and y. Notice that what is the left hand column here? u and x are the numerator and denominator functions in the derivative. And what is the right hand column? The common variable y is the variable which is maintained constant. You will find this in your uh, calculus book and you can check this out for yourself using the definition of Jacobian. u and x need not be in the first column. The common variable, the constant variable y needs to be common in some column, either second column or the first column. So, you can also write it like this, but if you have the common variable on a diagonal, either the principal diagonal or the secondary diagonal, then you have to have a negative sign. So, this is an important relation that partial of u with respect to x at constant y can be written down in terms of Jacobian in four different ways. Select one which you find convenient and we will use these and other properties of the Jacobian to manage the Maxwell's relations. I will give you an example here. First, suppose we want to uh, find out the equivalent of partial of t with respect to v at constant s. First, we have to determine whether this is a candidate for Maxwell's relation. Going back, we will notice that the four Maxwell's relations have something in common. If you go to this slide, you will notice what is common. If you spend a few minutes with this, you will find that the pair T s and the pair P v occurs in a combination where either the numerator and the constant function or the denominator and the constant function is either T s or P v. Notice there is a T s here, there is a P v here. Similarly, there is a T s here and there is a P v here in some order. Similarly, there is a T s here and there is a P v here. Similarly, here there is a T s and a P v. So, this tells us whether a given partial derivative is a candidate for Maxwell's relation or not. Now, given partial of temperature with respect to volume, we notice that there is a T s pair the constant function with either the numerator or denominator should form the pair T s or P v. Now, it is T s, so we can go ahead uh, with our scheme, this will be a candidate in the Maxwell's relation. So, you first write this as a Jacobian partial of T s with respect to V s, just put s as the common variable in the numerator and denominator. Then, because T s is in the numerator, multiply this by 1, which is partial of P v multiplied by T s. By thermodynamics, this Jacobian is 1. Now, we use the product characteristics of product property of Jacobian. There is a partial of T s here, there is a partial of T s here cancel out. We end up with partial of P v with respect to V s. And now, we notice that a diagonal is common v. So, this must equal negative of the partial derivative of p with respect to s at constant volume. Okay. I recommend that you spend some time in uh, deriving these, because you do not have to really go through this detail. 
when we install exercises, uh, when we do exercises, I will show you a quick symbolic short form by which you can do this. You need not write all these things down, although for the first few uh, attempts, you should do this. Now, after this, what we are going to do is derive, I leave it to you as an exercise to derive all these things, uh, all the four partial derivatives, all the eight partial derivatives involved in Maxwell's relations and their reciprocals. And the next thing is going to be exercises, which we will do after the lunch break. There are still some 7 minutes to lunch break, so uh, I have a choice. I am just going to go to first 1241 NRI Institute, Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. Over to you, sir. Sir, one question that arises in my brain is, we have centigrade scale of temperature we have ideal gas scale and we have thermodynamic scale of temperature. All three scales have independent different origin. Centigrade scale is based on uh, melting point of and boiling point of H2O. Whereas ideal gas scale is based on the fact that uh, at constant volume temperature is a function of pressure. Whereas our thermodynamic temperature scale is based on reversible is based on reversible Carnot cycle. Now the question that arises in my brain is, though their origin is independent, uh, why or how this coincidence has occurred that the unit, the magnitude of unit of temperature is same on temperature scale, same on centigrade scale as well as Kelvin scale as well as uh, thermodynamic scale. Over to you, sir. Okay, uh, good question. I would go the other way round. I will put the Celsius scale at the end. Uh, purely from a thermodynamic point of view, the only scale which we define is the thermodynamic Kelvin scale. Actually, uh, just because the traditional way of thermodynamics is teaching about ideal gas first and then coming to second. If I were to teach thermodynamics in a very pure way, I would not talk about any temperature scale till I come to the end of the second law and define the thermodynamic Kelvin scale of temperature. Then I will ask ourselves the question, a reversible engine cannot be implemented. So, what is the best we can do to implement and measure the Kelvin scale of temperature, the thermodynamic Kelvin scale of temperature. Then we would discover an ideal gas and we would show that the efficiency of the ideal gas Carnot cycle reversibly implemented is given by 1 minus T2 by T1 on the uh, thermodynamic Kelvin scale by definition. And using the ideal gas equation of state, we will show that the efficiency of a ideal gas Carnot cycle will be 1 minus P V product at the lower temperature divided by P V product at the higher temperature. And that way, I would then be able to show that the thermodynamic Kelvin scale can be implemented in practice using an ideal gas by implementing this demonstrated relationship that T 2 by T 1 or T 1 by T, let us say T 2 by T 1 on the thermodynamic Kelvin scale, it is shown to be equal to P 2 V 2 at sorry P 2 V 2 for an ideal gas working a Carnot cycle, where 2 is the state representing the lower temperature divided by P 1 V 1, where 1 is the state of the higher temperature. In this scale, in this case, I do not even have to define the ideal gas Kelvin scale. The ideal gas Kelvin scale had to be defined because we had to work some exercises, simple exercises using first law before coming to second law. So, this explains that although we have for our convenience defined them to be separately, in the end we have shown that the thermodynamic Kelvin scale 
and the ideal gas Kelvin scale are the same? That is the first question. I think that uh, answers the second part of your question that is ideal gas Kelvin and thermodynamics Kelvin. Now, when the first part of the question, I agree that the Celsius scale or sometimes called the centigrade scale was defined using the ice point and steam point and uh, till the early part of the 20th century that was so, but later on when uh, the you know there is an international union on pure and applied physics IUPAP and they decided that look we should not have these two different scales uh, Celsius and Kelvin. So, at that time it was decided that the Celsius scale should be got rid of and today Celsius scale is defined as temperature on the Celsius scale is temperature on the Kelvin scale minus 273.15. Okay. So, today there is no separate definition of the Celsius scale, the Celsius scale is today defined in terms of the Kelvin scale. Now, the question arises what is that funny number 273.16? The funny number 273.16 has been derived, it is extracted using experimental data, excellent experimental data, the PV product of an ideal gas and the ratios of these between uh, the ice point, the steam point and the triple point of water. It was discovered that the ratio of the PV uh, product of an ideal gas at the uh, uh, boil, normal boiling point of water to the PV product of the same ideal gas at the ice point turns out to be almost exactly 373.15 divided by 273.15 and based on this it was decided to use a standard value of 273.16 Kelvin for the triple point of water because if you define it like that the ice point turns out to be almost exactly 0 degree C but not exactly 0 degree C the steam point turns out to be almost exactly 100 degrees C, but not exactly 100 degrees C. Just to keep the uh, numerical difference in the temperatures of water at its ice point and at its steam point to be 100 units, which was the so in the earlier Celsius scale. We wanted to keep that on the Kelvin scale, so that all the earlier data based on Celsius scale can be converted to the Kelvin scale just by adding the number 273.15. It, it was just a matter of convenience. It was open to people to keep the define the Kelvin temperature of uh, the triple point of water to be 1.0 exactly or 100.0 or 1000.0 or any other arbitrary number. All that would have happened was the uh, distinction between Celsius or the relation between Celsius and Kelvin on the temperature scales would not have been as simple as Kelvin minus 273.15 is Celsius. That is all. Okay. The idea that Celsius is defined in terms of uh, ice point and steam point is now history. That is the historical definition of the Celsius scale. Today's definition of Celsius scale is in terms of the Kelvin scale. I hope that satisfies you. Over to you. Uh, one more question, sir. One day, one of my students uh, uh, gave an explanation to me that uh, I can create a reversible Carnot engine which can violate uh, the second law. And the simple thing that he told that I will make T lower uh, equal to absolute zero and definitely when T lower becomes equal to absolute zero, then uh, all the heat that the engine takes from the high temperature reservoir is getting converted into work. So, what answer I should give to my students, sir? Over to you, sir. Thank okay. you. There is an inherent assumption in the 
argument of the student and that assumption is that he will create a system whose temperature is 0 Kelvin. Okay. And now, we will say that look you are assuming here that you are creating a system with 0 Kelvin and you can simply use the argument that you cannot have such a system or you cannot create such a system because if you create such a system, you can work an engine reversible 2 T engine between say the ambient temperature and 0 Kelvin, the efficiency of that will be 1 and the Kelvin Planck statement says that you cannot have a 2 T heat engine the efficiency of which is 1. Actually, this argument is an argument uh, to the fact that you cannot create or you cannot have a system whose temperature is 0 Kelvin. Use his argument against him because he is assuming that the Kelvin Planck statement is violated and hence it says second law can be violated. Okay. Thank you, over and out.